It will elevate the spiritual level of the church very markedly. I want to talk about the eternity of God. In the first scripture text above, God calls himself the High and Lofty One that inhabiteth eternity. Eternity, of course, is a noun. It is the state of being eternal. There are those who say that such words in Scripture as eternity and everlasting do not mean time without end or lasting forever, because God refers to the everlasting hills in Genesis chapter 49, verse 26. They say that we have read into these words the concept of everlastingness and endlessness, that it only means to the end of the dispensation, to the end of the age. The real reason men have taken that attitude is because the Scriptures say that hell is everlasting and they can't bring themselves to believe that. If I thought that the word eternal, as referring to God, meant only lasting until the end of the age, I'd just fold my Bible up and go home and wait for the end. If I had a God that only lasted so long, that didn't have eternity in his heart, I couldn't possibly find it worthwhile to preach. Why be a pro-tem Christian and have a pro-tem God? I believe that God is eternal. The Old Testament Hebrew has exhausted itself, wrung its language as you wring a towel, to get the last drop of meaning out of it, to say that God is forever and ever endlessly, unto perpetuity, world without end. The New Testament Greek has done the same. There aren't any other words in the Greek language that can be used to mean unto perpetuity, having no end, going on and on and on and on, endlessly and forever. Then we come to the English language, which has the concept of endlessness. And how could we have a concept of that which doesn't exist, a concept that is greater than the reality? That is plain foolishness, as anyone can see. So we haven't any other words to use. Eternal, everlasting, forever, unto perpetuity, world without end, all of those words mean just what they say. When God talks about himself, that's what he means, the high and lofty one who exists eternally, forever, under perpetuity, world without end. And when we come to the second text, from everlasting to everlasting thou art God, the Hebrew lexicon tells us that you could translate it from the vanishing point to the vanishing point because that's what it actually means, from the vanishing point of the past to the vanishing point of the future. But whose vanishing point? Not God's, but man's. Man looks back as far as he can, then turns around and looks forward as far as he can, until human thought falls exhausted and human eyes can no longer see. Unto perpetuity, unto man's vanishing point, world without end. Other meanings of the word are concealed and out of mind. From the time concealed to the time concealed, Thou art God. From the time out of mind to the time out of mind, Thou art God. God is not dependent. Shake your head to get all the wheels going and try to stretch your mind all you can. Then think, if you can, about the past. Think your hometown out of existence. Think back to when there wasn't anything here but some Indians. Then go back and think all those Indians away back to before the Indians got here. Go back before that and think away the North American continent. And then think away all this earth of ours. And then let's go back and think that there are no planets and no stars dotting the clear night sky. They have all vanished away and there is no Milky Way, no anything. Go to the throne of God and think away the angels, the archangels, the seraphim and the cherubim that sing and worship before the throne of God. Think them all away until there is no creation. Not an angel waves its wing. Not a bird flies in the sky. There's no sky to fly in. Not a tree grows on a mountain. There is no mountain for a tree to grow on. But God lives and loves alone. The Ancient of Days, world without end, to the vanishing point back as far as the human mind can go, there you have God. The great Augustine said, What then art thou, O my God, what I ask but the Lord God? For who is Lord but the Lord, or who is God save our God? Most High, 
most excellent, most potent, most omnipotent, most piteous and most just, most hidden and most near, most beauteous and most strong, stable, yet contained of none, unchangeable yet changing all things, never new, never old, making all things new, yet bringing old age upon the proud, and they know it not, always working, yet ever at rest, gathering, yet needing nothing, sustaining, pervading, and protecting. Yet, O oh my God, my life, my holy joy, what is this that I have said? And what saith any man when he speaks of thee? Yet woe to them that keep silence, seeing that even they who say most are as the dumb. But thou, O Lord, whoever livest, and in whom nothing dies, since before the world was, and indeed before all that can be called before, thou existest, and art the God and Lord of all thy creatures, and with thee fixedly abide the causes of all unstable things, the unchanging sources of all things changeable, and the eternal reasons of all things unreasoning and temporal. God is not dependent upon his world, upon kings and presidents, upon businessmen and preachers, upon boards and deacons. God is not dependent upon anything. We have thought our way back until there's no history, back to God himself, God the Eternal One. God has no beginning. God never began to be. I want you to kick that word began around a little in your mind and think about it. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. But God himself never began to be. Began is a word that doesn't affect God at all. There are many concepts and ideas that don't touch God at all, such as the concept of beginning or creation, when God spoke and things began to be. In the beginning God created. But before the beginning there wasn't any beginning. There wasn't any before. The old theologians used to say that eternity is a circle. Round and round the circle we go, but back before there was any circle, God was. God didn't begin to be. God was. God didn't start out from somewhere. God just is. And it's good that we get that in our minds. Time, you see, is a creature word, because it has to do with things that are. It has to do with the angels, with the lake of fire, with the cherubims, and all the creatures that are around the throne of God. They began to be. There was a time when there were no angels. Then God said, Let there be, and the angels began to be. But there never was a time when God was not. No one said, Let God be. Otherwise, the one who said, Let God be, would have to be God. And the one about whom he said, Let him be, wouldn't be God at all, but a secondary God, who wouldn't be worth our trouble. God, back there in the beginning, created. God was, that's all. God is not in time. Time cannot apply to God. C.S. Lewis gave us an illustration which I'd like to pass on to you. If you can, think of eternity, of infinitude, as a pure white sheet of paper extending infinitely in all directions. Then think about a man taking a pencil and drawing a line, one inch long, on that infinitely extended sheet of paper. And that little line is time. It begins, and it moves an inch, and ends. It begins on the paper, and it ends on the paper. So time began in God, and will end in God, and it doesn't affect God at all. God dwells in an everlasting now. No age can heap its outward years on thee. Dear God, thou art thyself thine own eternity. You and I are creatures of time and change. It is in now and was and will be and yesterday and today and tomorrow that we live. That's why we get nervous breakdowns, because we're always just one jump ahead of the clock. We get up in the morning, look at the clock, and let out a gasp of dismay. We rush to the bathroom, brush our teeth, tear downstairs for breakfast, eat a half-cooked egg, and rush out to catch the commuter bus. That's time, you see. Time is after us. 
but God Almighty sits in his eternal now, and all the time that ever was is only a tiny mark upon the infinitely extended bosom of eternity. God has no past or future. God has no past. Now I want you to hear that, and I want you to shake your head hard here because this is an idea that the old church fathers knew but that we, their children, don't seem to care much about. God has no past. You have a past. It isn't really very long, although you may wish it wasn't so long. But God has no past and no future. Why doesn't God have a past or a future? Because past and future are creature words, and they have to do with time. They have to do with the flowing motion of time. But God is not riding on the bosom of time. Time is a little mark across the bosom of eternity, and God sits above time dwelling in eternity, from everlasting to everlasting thou art God. It is a wonderful thought that God has already lived all of our tomorrows. God has no yesterdays and no tomorrows. The scriptures say, Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 8. But it's not his yesterday, it's yours and mine. Jesus Christ the Lord is the one who came out of Bethlehem, out of Judea, whose goings forth have been even from everlasting. He can't have yesterdays and tomorrows because yesterday is time and tomorrow is time. But God surrounds it all and God has already lived tomorrow. The great God who was present at the beginning when he said, Let there be, and there was, is also now present at the end, when the worlds are on fire and all creation has dissolved and gone back into chaos, and only God and his redeemed saints remain. Remember that God has already lived our tomorrows. I wonder if that could be the reason that men can prophesy. The ability to foretell with precision an event that will take place three thousand years from now? How can that be? It might be that a prophet in the Spirit is up in God, seeing as God sees the end from the beginning. Isaiah chapter 46 verse 10. So God way up there takes the end from the beginning and looks down. And that's where we ought to be. Not down here looking up through the clouds, but up looking down. Sometimes when I go here and there I take a plane. Once you get up in the air, you've got so much sunshine that if you want to read, you've got to shut the little curtains to keep the sun off your book. But down below you see a solid carpet of thick clouds, and you find it very difficult to understand how anybody can be down there saying, Oh, what a cloudy, overcast, gloomy day this is. It isn't cloudy and overcast and gloomy up where you are. You're looking down on it. So if you insist on being down here looking up, you're always going to have an overcast sky. The devil will see to that. But if you remember that your life is hid with Christ in God, then you'll be looking down on it and not looking up. The scripture says in Psalm 90 verse 12 that because God is eternal, we must learn to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. God is in our today because God was in our yesterday and will be in our tomorrow. God is the one you can't escape. You can't escape God by denying Him because He will be there anyway. You can't escape Him by redefining Him into something else because He will be there anyway. God is. And because God is, then God is here and God is now. God dwells in an everlasting and eternal now. When God talked with Abraham, Jacob, and Isaiah, he had already lived in the New Jerusalem because the New Jerusalem is in the heart of God. All the things that will be are in God. God isn't subject to the flow of time. Christ, the Eternal Son, is timeless. When you think about Jesus, you have to think twice. You have to think of his humanity and his deity. He said a lot of things that made it sound as if he wasn't God. He said other things that made it sound as if he wasn't human. He said, for instance, before Abraham was, I am, John chapter 8, verse 58. That made it sound as if he antedated creation. Then he said, I can of mine own self do nothing, as I do here I judge, chapter 5, verse 30. And that made it sound as if he wasn't divine. He said, My father is greater than I, 
chapter 14, verse 28, and that made it sound as if he wasn't God. And he said, I and my father are one, chapter 10, verse 30, and that made it sound as if he wasn't human. But the fact is, he is both. He talked about himself as divine and as human, and when Jesus talked about himself as human, he used humble, lowly words. When he talked about himself as divine, he used words that startled and shook people. He said, speaking about the inspired scriptures, Ye have heard that it was said, but I say unto you, Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 22. He could talk like God, and then he could talk like man. So we've always got to think about the Son of Man, Jesus Christ the Lord, in two ways. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, under the law. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, that he might deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 15. That means his humanhood. And then he was slain from the foundation of the world. Revelation chapter 13, verse 8. What can that mean? How can he be slain from the foundation of the world? When God laid the heaven and the earth and caused the grass to be upon the hills and the trees to be upon the mountains, when God made the birds to fly in the air and the fish to swim in the sea, God had already in his heart lived Calvary and the resurrection and the glory and the crown. So he was slain before the foundation of the world. We pray to God sometimes as though God were panicky, as though God were in as great a distress as we are, and we pull out our watch and look at it. I refuse to wear a wristwatch. It's bad enough to have a watch in my pocket where it's difficult to get to. But if I had to look at the miserable thing all the time and know that time is getting away from me, I think I'd panic. But God never panics because God never looks at clocks or watches. The fullness of time was the time when God had ordered it. When that time came, Mary gave birth to her boy, and he was born and lived and died the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. So the Eternal Son has lived through all time. He who was born in Bethlehem's manger did not take his origin in the womb of the Virgin. The human baby did, but the Eternal Son did not. Time Marches On now, I don't like to be gloomy, but you might as well face the fact that time, like an ever-rolling stream, bears all its sons away. They fly, forgotten, as a dream dies at the opening day. Time, like an ever-rolling stream, is carrying a lot of people away. My wife and I were discussing this some time ago, and she said it looks as if every time we get a letter from back home, somebody else is dead. Well, it's natural. You can expect it, you know. Everybody has to die. Time, like an ever-rolling stream, bears all its sons away. Out in California, I've seen the redwood, or sequoia tree, and I wanted to know how big around the thing was. I'm an old farmer, and I don't have to have a measuring tape. I can just pace it off. I marked where I started in the dirt, and then I walked around that tree, hugging it as tight as I could. And when I got around, I had paced off fifty-one feet. And I dimly remember enough mathematics to know that it was seventeen feet thick. Now that's a sequoia tree. And it grows up as high as three hundred feet, thirty stories in the air. How long did it take to grow that big? I don't know, but the scientists say... I don't quote scientists too often because they change their minds and leave a man out on a limb, that some of those sequoia trees go back as far as Abraham, and even before Abraham's time. Not the species, but those very trees. When Abraham left Ur of the Chaldees and followed the gleam of faith downward to Negev, where he finally established his great nation in the land we now call Palestine, those trees were growing out there in California standing looking up at the sun, nourishing themselves by their roots. Those trees were already there. And when the Greeks took over the world, 
and not only militarily, they became the great minds of the ages, and were thinking their great thoughts and writing their funny plays, those trees were a little taller and still growing out there. And when Rome took over and became the Iron Kingdom and brought the world to her feet, and the soldiers of Rome went everywhere, conquering and to conquer, the trees out on the California coast were a little bit taller. And when the British people got out of the woods and stopped eating acorns and began to wash behind their ears and clean up and look human, why, the trees were a little taller than they had been before. And long before William the Conqueror had been across the Channel and Columbus went sailing around and discovered a little piece of land and called it America, those trees were out there. And way back when George Washington crossed the Delaware, and long before there was any communism or fascism or Nazism, and long before there were airplanes or any of these modern things, the trees grew out there, looking down upon generation after generation of men. For generation after generation, looking down from his everlasting now, is the eternal God, watching the little tribes of men, live a little while and lie down and die, and another generation come. We need God. Remember that God is to you a necessity. I preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and say, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Quoting the lovely words of Jesus that warmed my heart when I was a boy and helped bring me to him. When I quote those words, and when I quote the words of the gospel that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, John chapter 3, verse 16. I'm doing you a tremendous favor, because you need God. We are slaves to time. We find our immortality in God and nowhere else. We sing, O God, our help in ages past. What ages past? God's ages past? No. God lives in now. Our ages past, the brief race of men. Our hope for years to come, and your hope and my hope for years to come. And may this God be thou our guide while life shall last, and our eternal home. I need somebody to guide me. I can't go it alone. I'm too small and weak and stupid and vulnerable. Microbes so small I can't see get in my nose and start down my neck, and the next thing you know it's in my lungs and I have pneumonia, and then I'm gone. That's us poor little creatures. Immortality and eternity you'll only find in God, and you'll only find God through Jesus Christ the Lord. I am not pleading the cause of one who failed. I am pleading the cause of one who has conquered absolutely and sits at the right hand of God now in eternity. One time, when I went to the museum, I wandered into the Egyptian room and looked at the mummies there. They'd taken some of them and partly unwrapped them to show them off. Old fellows with their teeth fallen out and their chins meeting their noses. There were little babies there and one little chap who was probably seven years old. I looked down at that mummified boy, and I began to grieve. I walked from one crypt to the other looking at these mummified human beings. Some of them had been kings, incidentally, but now they were lying all wrapped up in gunny sacks, so dry that they had to keep the wind off them, or they would have blown away. Dust, dust, dust. I saw sunken eyes and sunken cheeks and tough, leathery arms that had been uncovered for the occasion. There they were, human beings who had lived before England was, before Greece was, before Rome. I walked around down there till I got gloomy. I'm kind of sensitive and easily affected, and I began to get gloomier and gloomier, feeling more miserable all the time. It was past noon, and I was hungry, and they had a restaurant that was just the next room over from the mummies. But I couldn't have eaten if they'd given me caviar and hummingbird tongues. I was sick, sick in my heart, sick in my body, sick to think that men made in the image of God had to die and turn to dust. When I walked out of there and headed home, I was about as gloomy as they come. I had a book of poems with me by an Englishman named Thomas Campbell, 
so I read one called The Last Man. I had just come from looking at dead men, and now I was reading a fanciful story poem written by a man who believed in Jesus Christ. It was beautifully written, for he was a master craftsman, though not perhaps one of the greatest of the poets. The poem was a dream or vision he had about seeing the human race down to the last man. There had been pestilences, famines, wars, and all sorts of things that whittled the human race down till there was only one man left. Everyone else was dead. This man was leaning on his elbow high upon a promontory, looking out over the western ocean as the sun was setting, and he knew it would be the last sunset he would ever see, for the rattle of death had already come, and his eyes were getting glazed, but he could still think, and still talk a little. So as he gazed out at the setting sun, he began to talk to the sun, and he said, By him recalled to breath, who captive led captivity, who robbed the grave of victory, and took the sting from death. Then after he had reminded himself that there was one who had risen from the dead, and had robbed death of its sting, and taken away victory from the grave, he spoke to the sun and said, Go, sun, while mercy holds me up, on nature's awful waste, to drink this last and bitter cup of grief that man shall taste. Go tell the night that hides thy face, thou sawst the last of Adam's race, on earth's sepulchral clod, the darkening universe defy, to quench his immortality, or shake his trust in God. He was saying, Son, when you are old and burned out, and have gone to dust, I'll still be living, because I live in him who captive led captivity, and robbed the grave of victory, and took the sting from death. Well, you know what that did for me that lifted me up out of the miry clay and established me, my emotions at least, on the solid rock. I had just come from seeing kings and queens and little babies and half-grown kids all done up in gunny sacks, all of them three thousand years old. I thought, oh boy, is that where I'm headed? Then I read this poem, and I thank God that my soul was lifted up. I came back home a joyful man, Remembering that no matter what you do to the body, no matter how much you wrap it up or embalm it, Jesus Christ recalled back the human breath and took the sting from death and gave victory to man. You need God, for God is your eternity. You need God, for God is your tomorrow. You need Jesus Christ, for Jesus Christ is your tomorrow. He is your guarantee of that which will be. He is your resurrection and your life. And when the sun has burnt itself out and the stars have been folded up like a garment, God will still be. For God dwells in an everlasting now that nothing can get to. And he takes his children who believe in his Son into his bosom, into the heart of the everlasting now. That's why I believe in the communion of saints. I do not believe that one saint that leaves the earth goes anywhere but into the heart and bosom of God, to be a timeless, endless, forever saint. And I believe that all these great Hebrew and Greek and English words that apply to God, eternity and forever and unto perpetuity and world without end, will apply to every man and woman who is in the bosom of God. I'll settle for that, won't you? If somebody came along to me and said, We're going to take you to heaven, but you can only be up there for twenty years, I'd be a miserable man. What's the good of getting used to a place like that and learning to love it and then having to leave it in twenty years? But I accept for my own soul and for the souls of all the Lord's children these wondrous words, eternal, everlasting, forever, unto perpetuity, world without end. I accept the everlastingness of the saints. Why can we believe in our own immortality? Because God is eternal. That's basic to the doctrine of immortality. If God were not eternal, there could be no immortality and no certain future for anybody. We would only be cosmic dust that somehow or other managed to get shifted into human beings or trees or stars, and then only to be swept away again and blown into immensity and forgetfulness. But because God is eternal, we have our home in God. We can look forward with calm restfulness to the time that shall be. 
Chapter 4 God's Omnipotence 